This is your friendly neighborhood author, Jonathan, and you are listening to Season 4 of the Floor Rejects Podcast, The Wells House Phenomenon. Last week on the Floor Rejects podcast, Warren was found flying through the air. He smashed into his grandfather's truck, he broke his arm, he cut himself up, um, and he ended up alone in the middle of the street, uh, waiting for an ambulance to come that he wasn't sure was coming because nobody seems to know how to work technology where he lives. Um, This was the plan all along, of course, that he had come up with with Thomas and his grandfather, but... He doesn't know that during the day. So let's see how he fares in chapter 26, I think. Yeah. Chapter 26. Clarity. As the ambulance rocked its way over country roads to the county hospital, Warren found himself plagued with confusion on top of his pain. He could almost see Edward disappearing in his mind's eye. He was out of the car and standing stock still in a moment, and Warren couldn't reason it as he moaned and rolled in agony. His arm, he would find out, was fractured in three places. His leg would require 17 stitches and his scalp would need sutures as well. He woke up alone and cold in a bare-bones hospital room the day after his incident, having slept fitfully with no dreams the night of the incident. He was groggy and bewildered when he opened his eyes to the harsh daylight streaming over his face. Oh. He groans, and a nurse pops around his doorframe within a few seconds. Hi, sugar. I'm Kathy, your daytime nurse. Do you need something for the pain? Maybe something to eat? You're all skin and bones, she pipes, and Warren croaks in the affirmative. She returns with a small cup of pills and a water. Warren gulps greedily, his body oddly stiff even considering his injuries. When he swallows the pills, Kathy smiles. Just hit that call button when you need me, sugar. You're the only one on my rounds so far. She's irritably cheery. Warren smiles politely, but as soon as she leaves, he wishes that she was back. He wasn't used to being alone anymore. He looked down to his arm, and the IV in his vein was annoying him, but he notices that it looks strange, alien. The veins are pronounced, pressed to his skin, and his arm looks too thin to be his. He panics, lifting his blankets to find that his legs, even covered in bandages, are gangly, his knees knobbed and cocked at odd angles. He scrambles to his feet as quickly as he can muster and wheels his IB bag with him to the bathroom. When he gets in and the light flips on, he gasps. His face is sunken, his cheeks sticking out like ships sinking into the ocean. His eyes are hollowed, glowing in panic from deep within his face. He holds up an arm and the skin's hanging from bone. He can't process it. His mind is convinced that it isn't him, that he wasn't looking at his own reflection but someone else's. He falls back against the wall, trembling and sliding to the floor as his reflection follows him, mirroring the movement. No, he murmurs, looking down at his bony, gnarled fingers. He begins to weep, his confused turning to outright terror as he feels the hot drip of blood on his face. Just as he reaches up to feel his head, there's a knock at the door. Hun, you okay? Kathy calls from the opposite side, and Warren can't even muster a sound as she begins to knock insistently, her voice growing higher with each rap on the door. I'm coming in, she shouts, and the door rattles with the sound of keys swinging open and clipping Warren's already bruised ankles. Sugar, come here, you're bleeding, she coos, pulling Warren up and guiding him back to his bed, his mind whirling as she checks his head, taking and prodding and doing her best not to make a sound. Warren winces and she smiles. I'm coming back in just a minute. Don't move, she instructs, and Warren mutters incoherently, his body wavering from the drugs as she shakily stitches him back up. She chides him under her breath, but as the drugs take hold, he doesn't hear her. Instead, his mind begins to wander and fade, and before he knows it, he's in a dream. In his dream, which was nothing like the dreams he could remember, he was staring down at himself, watching Kathy sew his skin back up, blood running up her gloves and down his forehead. He stares in outright anguish as his nurse shakes at his shoulder, and as if to wake him, but his body doesn't move. She shakes harder, but she eventually checks his monitor, shrugs, and leaves. As he floats above himself, his mind does regain some clarity, a few flashes of his real memories. He sees the house dilapidated and rotting around him, 
a flash of Edward's inhuman smile. Then he sees Thomas, his body glowing and bumps pressed up against his skin as he looks over at Warren in his mind's eye. And Warren can hear himself yelp, and he makes eye contact with his own body for a split second before he realizes now that he was staring up at the ceiling, his vision covered in black dots. He leans up, his head still throbbing, but notices that the sun was no longer so bright in the window. In fact, it was dark enough in the room that he had to squint to read his bracelet. Kathy comes back in, the hands on her wristwatch glowing faintly in the dim light. Hey, hun, i I'm about to switch you out with the night nurse, Trish. Do you need anything? She asks, and Warren clears his throat. Some food? He asks, his voice raspy and hushed. Of course, sugar. I'll let her know that you're ready. She says, and she leaves the room, the overhead lights humming as they brighten on a timer. Soon Trish, a squat motherly nurse, shows up with a pink plastic tray of food. It's almost inedible, the meat gray and gelatinous and the corn and peas stuck in a solid lump on the side. He picks at the food, his mind still slowed, and wonders what his friends at the house were up to, as well as his lover. He keeps thinking about Edward, but the longer he does, the less he can remember his face. In fact, as he lays there in the bed, the concrete details of his life begin to slip from his mind. When he tries to remember Lila, he can only see a young, beautiful woman with bright red hair in his mind, but he knows she's an old woman. But in his mind, he just can't picture her. He shakes it from his thoughts, instead trying to remember his family. And them he can see clearly. He can picture his dead father, his alcoholic mother, and every pet he had as a child with perfect sight. When he pictures his grandfather, though, it's fuzzy. He can see him, but in a black haze all over. The night drags on, and after another round of painkillers, he's launched into a restful, dreamless sleep. His body appreciates it, and when he wakes up, even though the pain is still more, but he's alert and upbeat when Kathy comes back in with an equally unappealing breakfast. As he takes in his body, his appearance, Kathy takes note. Mr. Wells, are you okay? Do you need some help? Is someone hurting you? She asks seriously as she pushes something into his IV bag. He stutters for a moment as if he's unsure. Uh, uh, no, I am perfectly fine. I think I just needed some time off, he says vaguely, recognizing the warning signs of a possible longer stay in this place. Are you sure? You can tell me, she goads, but Warren shakes his head as the nurse busies herself around the room. She looks at him to say something else, but then a ringing at the desk outside of the room has her hurrying away. Relieved, he pulls at his bracelet, a thought slamming into his head like a ton of bricks. He remembers he can't be away from the house for more than two days. He knows that he doesn't want to risk the loss of his new house and security, and so after he hears Kathy hang up the phone, he rings her with the call button. She comes back in, an expectant look on her face, like she was ready for him to confess. He pulls his weak frame up on the bed and smiles as best he can, but he worries so that she can hear it as his jaw clicks. Kathy, I think I'm ready to go home, he says, and her face drops. Oh, not yet, dear. No, no. You need to stay at least another day. You haven't even been able to see the doctor on call while you're awake. You need to stay, she says, and Warren shakes his head as firmly as he can. No, I have to get back to the house. It's, it's important. My uh, cat is probably starving, Warren says, and when Kathy tells him to call a friend, all he can tell her is that he doesn't have any. Well, technically you can check yourself out, but I wouldn't recommend it. Seriously, Warren, she says gently, but he's persistent, and she nods and goes to get his discharge paperwork. He finds his clothes in a bag in the bedside drawer and gingerly dresses, his pants ripped and stiff with blood. Oh, gosh. Can you at least have someone bring you some clothes? Maybe a parent or a sibling? She asks as she hands him a paper full of forms to fill out. No. My mom lives too far away, he says as he signs his discharge. When he stands, he does his best to do so confidently and walk from the room. But when he turns to ask her a question, she has to nonchalantly grab the doorframe to steady himself. Is there a taxi service I can call? My truck is still at my place. He asks, and she smiles a confused smile. No, honey, there's no taxis around here. I can call someone for you, or I guess I could take you, she says, and reluctantly Warren nods, knowing he was running out of time, unsure how far away he was and how specific his contract would be or what he would encounter when he arrived. She nods, rushing to grab her purse and gestures for him to sit in a wheelchair. Policy, 
she says as he resists, and so he flops down, letting her wheel him out to an old green jeep. She lets him climb in on his own, and he gives her the address that she types into her phone, letting him know that it would be a 30-minute drive. On the way, he's happy to smoke her cigarettes, stare out the window, and chat idly with her as they winded their way back to the house. When they pull onto his street, he's taken aback to find that the truck is still sitting in the middle of it, the door still open, blood on the seats. Kathy's taken aback. Hun, you need to tell me if you need help. I can find someone who... She begins, but Warren looks at her, his mind feeling muddier the closer they draw to it. I'm okay, Kathy. I promise. I just live alone out here so no one's moved the truck, he says, and she nods reluctantly. She drops him off at it, again telling him to let her know if he needs any help, and gives him her phone number, which he pretends to program to his phone. When she drives away, the sound of her jeep fading in the distance, he looks to the gate and climbs to the beaten, caved-in cab of the truck. He sees the keys are still in the ignition in the on position, but when he tries to crank the truck over, he realizes it's been run out of gas. Shit, he mutters, and limps over to the gate keypad. He types in the code to the gate, and it begins to open, but just as Warren begins to climb through, it slams shut. His head is pounding as the pain meds wear off, and the sound triggers the pain. He tries again, and this time the gate mechanism whirls and grinds as if something was holding it closed, and eventually it just clicks. When he tries a third time, it just clicks again, as if it was broken. He rattles the thing, wondering how to get the attention of those in the house since they don't have phones and the house was a quarter mile up the hill. He can't see anyone around, no one on the other side of the gate, and he has a flash of another memory, of the brothers in the rear view of the truck standing there as the gate shut, and he rattles it again and again, hoping it would open. It does not, and in fact, it seems to be welded shut at this point. He knows climbing the gate is out of the question, and he leans back on it, sliding down the bars until he settles, knowing all he can do is wait and hope someone comes down. He starts to drift off to sleep, but just as his eyes shut, the gates rattle hard, knocking into his head. Hello? Warren calls as he turns, but no one is there. Then the gate rattles again, harder this time, and Warren sees a faint distortion in the air, almost like a person moving. Hello? He calls again, and when he looks up the drive, he can see Edward sprinting down it towards him. Edward! He yells in relief, but the man doesn't even look at him. Instead, he slams into the gate with his shoulder, but it doesn't look like he connects. Oh my god, stop! Warren shrieks, but the air wavers around Edward, who begins to curse, his body slamming up against the gate. Stop! Warren yells again, pushing against the gate, trying desperately to type something into the keypad. Edward grunts as an invisible force seems to hit him in the stomach, sending him reeling back, and after a moment he lunges forward, gripping something Warren can't see, and then his body begins to waver like the air around him. He looks up at Warren, a hateful look in his eye for a moment before he disappears into thin air, completely gone. No more sound, no more man, just silence and a rattling gate. Then, as if by magic, a minute of stunned silence later, the gate clicks, drifting open, not by mechanical force, but like the hinges had broken free and it swung towards the lawn. Warren, confused, tired, and hurt, huffs in disbelief and winces his way across the threshold, back on the property moments before he would have missed his window to return. Now, what do I like about this chapter? I like that it moves quickly. I like that we didn't spend a bunch of time focusing on what happens to Warren outside of the property, because it doesn't matter, ultimately. I thought about making Kathy this, like, important main character or someone who comes to his rescue, but really, she's she's not. That's not what we're here for. Um, I like how quickly it moves. I like that Warren gets to see his body. I also like that his body has changed. Not that I like that he's suffering, but that in the same way that he can't see the house the way it is unless he's allowed to, he can't see what's happening to his body unless he's allowed to. But I like that he's so focused on getting back to his house, to his money, to his security, that he doesn't even think about it. He doesn't even focus on the fact that he's shriveled up into this husk of a person, but he's actually like more focused on the money. He's more focused on getting back to what is security to him now, which I think is relatable for some people. You ignore what's going on with yourself to get back to your security before you, you know, lose it. Um, so that's what I really like about this chapter. I like the imagery of Edward kind of fighting with this invisible force, which we can assume is Thomas, and then him kind of just warping and disappearing as well. And I really like that last 
minute or two where Warren is just standing at the gate. He's just watched a man disappear into thin air and then the gate just clicks and opens. It swings open. I do think when I write things, I write them more like somebody who would be writing a screenplay probably writes things. And this is a first draft, so it is probably more akin to a screenplay just in format and in information. But I like that that image of him walking across the threshold not knowing what he's doing. And I also like the juxtaposition between his dreams on the property and his dreams outside because as soon as he's outside of the uh, property, he can remember his dreams and they're horrible dreams or he can sleep and just sleep and his body is so grateful for that that even with a broken arm, a cut up leg and a cut up head, he's more alert, he's happier just because he's able to sleep. Um, so that's what I really like about this chapter. I'm getting better at narrowing down what I like. Uh, some things I need to work on still is not repeating the same words and not necessarily he said, he said, she said, she said. What I also notice is sometimes I repeat the same sort of descriptive phrases or variations of a descriptive phrase. Like I used sunken and sunk twice within like two sentences. I don't really want to do that. It just feels a little bit too repetitive. Um, I also struggle with using words that mean the same thing for the same thing too often, if that makes sense. Like, uh, he's sitting there angrily and then he does something angrily. I feel like I should be saying he is sitting there angrily and he does something aggressively or like a different word that means the same thing because I don't want to repeat myself. So those are some things I feel like I, I kind of need to work on still along with other things. And I feel like I need to work on moving out of this apartment because the planes overhead are just ridiculous. I apologize for the sound, but it's kind of the, the best I can do. You know what I mean? Even if I was hiding in my closet with all those clothes, you'd still hear it. So I don't know. This is a kind of a short chapter. It wasn't a super important part of the story other than to get him out of the house for two days. And because he wasn't sure and it's never really stated exactly what two days means, does it just mean within two days of you leaving, you have to come back? Does it mean 48 hours? How, how quick do you have to be? How precise do you have to be? I, I, I just like it. I like that it's fast, and I don't think every chapter has to be a meaningful chapter as far as, like, every single chapter doesn't have to... Everything needs to forward the plot, but it doesn't all have to be the most important chapter because if every chapter is the most important chapter, there is no important chapter. There's no climax because every single chapter is a climax, and that's not really how storytelling usually works. So... That's kind of what I like this week. I figure I'd give you a shorter episode. Um, if you don't know, I launched a Etsy store, and Etsy store, not a Etsy store, because Etsy begins with E. Uh, it's called The Floor Rejects, or just Floor Rejects. And I sell my art there, just, just minimalist art, not like paintings with lots of gusto and impasto and texture. They're minimalist drawings of bodies. Um, and I'm selling those. They're digital downloads, so you can download them and print them out if you want. You can download them and send them to a printer and have them printed out in these massive frames. I'm doing some research into linking it up to a company that will print things for you. Um, but that's kind of pricey. So I'm hoping that at some point something will take off so that I can pursue my art a little more um, easily because right now I just keep pursuing it and it keeps saying no, no, no over and over again. Um, so if you're interested in minimalist line art, if you're interested in like queer art or erotic art or you just feel like supporting me, um, that would be cool. It's the floor, It's not the Floor Rejects. It's Floor Rejects on Etsy. I think there's like 20 different pieces on there right now. Like I said, you buy it, you can download it, print it from your home printer. It, I think it comes as a JPEG. So you could literally buy it for like, I think they're $3.99 a piece and send it to a printer. Usually printing something with like staples is like, I don't know, $10, maybe 15. 
get a cheap frame from Walmart and you've got under 50 bucks, you got a big minimalist line art drawing, if that's something you're into. Uh, but either way, I appreciate you listening, watching, being here with me every single week. And I will talk to you guys next week. We're getting pretty close to the end of this story and then we'll take some time off and then I'll come back with a new one. So I'll talk to you next week. Bye.